Um, so that's a great segue. Uh, and Kim's, uh, Lisa, we're going to start in about five minutes. Listen, Kim, I just made you co-host of this next presentation. So, um, so I don't know if you have to accept that, but you're both now listed as co-hosts. Just in case you wanna share something, you now have controls to mute and unmute and share. Okay, perfect, Hi. thank you. I'm gonna go deal with some tech, tech, tech issues in some other rooms. So I'm going to leave, you, uh, leave this in your capable hands to start at 205, which is right now. Okay, is Lisa on? I'm right here, you yeah. hear me? Here we are. You want me to get started? Sure. We ready to go? Is everybody here? Or should we give them a couple more minutes? Possibly like maybe two more minutes. Sounds like a plan. I think there were 64 registered for the class. Right. I think we're down. Yeah. Let's give them a few minutes. Well, at least people don't have to commute. Exactly. Numbers are going down. I think everybody's taking uh, Kyle's advice on the potty break. Can't blame them. No. Right. I, um, during the workshop, we can probably, all three of us can, oh, and there we go. Yep. Um, we can take a look at the um, chat just to keep up with it. Sounds good to me. Okay. Oh, my chat covers the entire thing. Yeah, mine does too. Yeah. Okay, I know you guys are all lucky because you can mute, but listen, I had to pretty much uh, bribe our kids to be quiet during this thing. So let's, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> We apologize in advance, but I'm sure you'll all understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can probably get started. Okay, so let's do this. Um, so we're going to start in the beginning. By Kim and I are going to introduce ourselves and tell our story, and then we're going to get into the crux of the workshop, which is why SEPTA and the importance of SEPTA, and if you don't already have one, how you can get one. So first, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Lisa Zukoff. I'm the Special Education Specialist for the New York State PTA. I am also a past president of ASEPTA. So I understand and have great passion for what SEPTAs do. So I actually got on the SEPTA path when um, my son started attending uh, preschool. And because he was in a center-based preschool, I really had no connection with the other parents in my neighborhood. So I wasn't able to make those friends, and I would see them all going to the same camps and the same schools, and he didn't. And it was very difficult, and it certainly is isolating, and I'm sure we've all been there. And then what happened was he went into kindergarten. And I didn't really know a lot of parents, and he didn't know a lot of children because they had made those connections in preschool and in local events. Um, but what happened was I joined SEPTA, and it was the director of pupil services who told me to join the SEPTA. And I am so glad that she did that. And I'm going to tell you all that right now. That is probably one of your most important outreach contacts is the director of pupil services or your pupil services personnel because they know who's coming into the district and they know who could really benefit from what 
SEPTA has to offer. And so I went to the first meeting and I was amazed at this community that I found all these other people who were also dealing with what I was dealing with, who weren't judgmental, but in fact were offering guidance and advice. And it really was life changing. And then all of a sudden I learned how to advocate. I learned how to fight for what I needed, what my child needed. I learned that I was allowed to use my voice, that you could still be nice and still be very strong about what you needed to get done. And that's a hard lesson for many of us who were raised to always be good girls or nice. So I actually got so much from that. And then the next year they nominated me to be on the board because that's how it works. And then eventually I became president. And I took advantage of every training that the PTA offered and every training that I could get online that I could find out about that the state offered. And then I took the district up at that time. That's when a parent member was required part of the CSE. Um, they sent me for that training and I became a parent member. And through all that, I learned about the rights my family had, that my child had. And I also made a lot of connections with people in the district. So when I had to advocate, I knew exactly who was involved at what step. And the most important part is I made friends and I made contacts because even as we, our children grow and they learn new skills, you know, there are every step in life brings you more challenges. So now I have three children and that child's 16. And with the teen years brings a whole new host of issues. And I am so glad that I still have those parents who started on that path because we could still communicate and we could still talk and we're still all very active. But we're, the most important thing is that we're all advocates and we're all parents. So I'm obviously very passionate about this what SEPTAs can do and what the differences they made in, I know in my child's life. And so I just am so happy to have the opportunity to share this with other people. So now it's Kim's turn. Okay. Um, Kim Blasiak, I'm the outreach coordinator for New York State PTA. I have four children, um, one with autism, one who was diagnosed about a year and a half ago with ADHD executive functioning and anxiety. And my experience with the SEPSA, I'm currently a SEPSA co-president. So um, we moved to a new district five years ago and knew nothing. And I just thought it was very strange that no one talked to each other. Like you, if you would ask a question, you didn't know who the other parents were and no one said anything about their experiences. And I thought, well, this is kind of odd. So being from state PTA um, and going through the state PTA process, I was able to start a special education community, or I'm sorry, um, committee within our council. And then we chartered a SEPSA through that. Because we just, once we kind of sent out a notice saying, okay, we're gonna start this committee with the intention of turning into a SEPSA, parents came out of the woodwork and not only did parents, but teachers did too, because it's like, all right, we don't feel like we're getting enough support with this type of training and that type of training and what can we do? And it was great. We, we chartered and it just opened up a whole kind of opportunity for us because we felt that we had one voice, not to be corny, but it was nice to have that camaraderie with the other parents and even the teachers. Like we have special education teachers and gen ed teachers coming to our meeting saying, okay, what can we do? Or if you're having a training on this, can we come listen? Because there's, there's really so many different facets of education nowadays that it's really hard to get that specified training. But it's something that has kind of branched out. It's given a lot of people a voice to advocate. I've seen people who don't want to say anything turn into a very huge advocate for themselves and their children just because they've always been afraid to speak up thinking, oh, there's going to be retribution or something. But it's, it's been a great experience and we're still going strong. So it's, uh, SEPSAs are a little bit different from the regular PTAs or Gen Ed um, and Lisa will go through that. But yeah, that's, that's my story. I think it's a great story. And thank you for sharing. So we obviously have a lot to say, but before anything, just keep in mind, because I, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions and discussion at the end, some great, you can always reach out to Kim or myself, um, special education or outreach after this at NYSBTA.
Um, and you can also reach out, I would take note um, for Mary, we will send you all this information, our membership chair, for a uh, coordinator for the New York State PTA because she's going to give you a lot of resources also about thank you Kim um, your membership and at your region level every region is going to have somebody for special education and somebody for membership and those are valuable tools because every region has different strengths and this way you can always find somebody who can help you so don't forget that these are wonderful resources and the New York State PTA is always here to support the minutes so don't be afraid to ask for help Okay, so what we're really going to talk about today is the who, what, when, where, why, and how of stuff. So to get started, for those who don't know, a special education PTA, or SEPTA, SEPTA, is a unit organized for those interested in the issues of educating special needs and or gifted and talented children. So what the SEPTA will do is present topics and information that are useful to all children. You can and should join both the PTA and a SEPTA. Teachers, parents, and students can all benefit because these trainings apply to different people at different times. They bring, it brings information to families and it can be done in a variety of languages. Again, it can be held because it's a SEPTA at your local level. You can reach out to your community and you know your community's needs best. And because it's community-wide, we should always reach out to local private schools. You could ask, um, share your flyers and their events, post on a Facebook page or on your website so that other people can get this information. And as I mentioned before, definitely reach out to the PPS staff because they will know people who have younger children in the community. And as we discussed earlier, a lot of those parents of preschoolers aren't privy to some of that information and they would really benefit from coming to a meeting or from reaching out to some other parents. So a SEPTA, what does a SEPTA do? SEPTAs bring awareness and information about special education services, laws, and community source supports to our members. We can partner with the school district and participate in all kinds of awareness days and other community awareness events. For example, if it's April for its Autism Awareness Month, have the students Organize obviously through your district or wear a blue shirt. You can reach out to your local library and ask them as well as the school library, but the local library to have a bunch of resources on the topic available for people. You can even hold a contest, an essay contest, an art contest. There's so many different ways to reach out to the community beyond even just the school building, but take that whole theme. You can have a district staff present at a meeting or a virtual meeting um, because that also makes the staff feel part of what we are bringing and they all have different strengths and passions that we would love to hear from. So perhaps the person who works in the gifted teacher may have some tips, tricks, games that you can bring with your children and if you have something like that held right before a holiday break when there's going to be a lot of time at home, that may be something that parents can now do in their homes with their children. You can also have something where they meet the administrator, especially when it's a transition time. If you have your elementary schools transitioning to a high school, a uh, middle school or a middle school transitioning to a high school, these are going to be new people the parents are going to be dealing with. So a familiar face is always valuable. And then they can also go over some of the steps that are involved and answer some of those questions that parents have. Anything to alleviate that anxiety during change, and you're bringing this valuable information to your, to your community. Sponsor an author assembly. If there's somebody who writes like age-appropriate books on living with a disability or on a specific topic, if you have them come, obviously right now I don't think we're having a lot of assemblies, but maybe they'll be done virtually and there's always another year, have them come speak to the students. Have, then if you can donate some of those books to classrooms or to the school library, this is going to continue teaching even after this person has left. So obviously a lot of what we're discussing is meetings. So I'll go over a few topics and then at the end of this when we have some conversation, you know, please let us know what's worked for your school district. So advocacy is important, how to, reach an, how to read an IEP, tips for attending a CSE meeting, you can bring in speakers on a variety of different conditions, dyslexia, sensory awareness, ADHD, anything. The sky is the limit. 
mental wellness is a very important topic, especially right now. You can discuss anxiety, depression, suicide awareness is a very hot topic, puberty, sexuality, all these things as our children grow and change, we need to know how best to support them and how to approach these topics with them. Support the families too, the siblings, keeping relationships healthy. That's a fun topic to bring around Valentine's Day, something for the parents to help them communicate better. And also caring for the caregiver, yoga or meditation or stress relief. You know, anything that would work, you can think about, it can, it can be done. And as we've learned, there's a lot that we can do online and virtually now. Things that we never thought could be done virtually can be. So, when does septus, it's just when does the septus meet? Well, all septus conduct their regular business during the school year, just like any other PTA. I suggest you offer both day and evening meetings to ensure families with varying schedules can participate. And it's even after the pandemic is over and maybe we're all meeting in person, think about continuing to offer virtual meetings. There are many parents where childcare is an issue where they can't get to the meetings, but they would really like to receive that information and they would like to be a part of it. So definitely see what you could do to reach out to them in different ways. You can also share information in different ways. You can do it on your websites or social media, email. Again, working through school personnel because they are really going to be the people who are going to find your newest members. You can meet anywhere a PTA meets. So if we're in the school, most schools will allow you to meet. But if not, some uh, septas because they're district wide aren't comfortable meeting in a school or they rotate among different schools. You can also ask your library if there is space or if there's a local restaurant or business owner that has space to allow you to have your meeting, you can really reach out to the community and they're very supportive because everybody wants to work together to the benefit of our children. So we've discussed a lot of this and really, so why do we want a SEPTA? Well, I think we pretty much know why we want a SEPTA because SEPTAs are designed to build strong partnerships amongst parents, teachers, administrators, existing PTAs, and the community for the benefit of families and children receiving special education services. And it's important when we say existing PTAs because it's not an either or, it's a both. We all need to work together. We can enhance that community support. We can increase that communication. We can advocate for our most vulnerable learners. Obviously, we're gonna form friendships and we're gonna share, especially on a hyper-local basis, information of local resources that maybe you won't find at a, at a larger organization. It's also, um, we discussed briefly before Kyle was talking about stigma. We may have more of a stigma than our children do because in the classroom, the children are aware of who has an aid and who's getting pulled out for some help and who's getting speech. And most of them really don't notice. It just is a part of the day. So I think a lot of it is also when you're meeting with other parents in this similar scenario, it helps you to kind of realize that this is just every day. And this is nothing, there's no reason that you could not reach out to more resources to support your child, but there's absolutely nothing wrong here. And that's the most valuable lesson you're gonna learn. So I think the next step now, we've realized how wonderful SEPTAs are, um, but we wanna know if we don't already have one, how do we charter a SEPTA? Well, fortunately we have Kim, who is our Nursing PTA Outreach Coordinator, who's gonna tell us some tips about that part. Okay, so how to charter a SEPTA. First of all, and I have, sorry, I'm, I'm toggling between two different screens for my notes here. Okay, so the, the process to charter a SEPSA is the same as chartering a, a regular, I guess a regular, and as a special needs parent, regular in general sometimes come with the air quotes, um, a regular or general PTA. So the SEPSA has to support the PTA's mission, value, and basic policy and position statements. Um, your members of a SEPSA, it could either be um, in one building, in multiple buildings, district-wide. It could be multiple districts. Um, ours is a community SEPSA, so it's not necessarily just the school district because realistically, 
um, special education tends to encompass ages three through 21. So we are a community SEPSA open to anyone. We have members from other districts as well. Okay. And one thing that has changed that I've been made aware of is when, and I'll go through the process as well, but when you are chartering, you used to have to have an administrator from a school building sign off on your charter. Well, that's not the case um, with this. So of course you want to have the administrators on your side and you want them to be able to sign, but according to national, they don't have to. So sometimes that really alleviates a little bit of stress because I'll be honest, there are some districts that think that SEPTAs are just kind of out to, to form this alliance against the district um, until they really get to know what a SEPTA is and their, their fears are alleviated a little bit, it tends to be tense sometimes at the beginning. So, I mean, we're really just an advocacy group. That's, that's what the administrators find out. So um, also when you charter a SEPSA, if you wanna charter a SEPSA, um, we'd recommend looking for other SEPSAs within your area, just to maybe talk to them. Um, just for example, our unit also um, talks to, uh, to, in general, to other SEPSAs in our area. We've invited them to our back to school picnics. We've been invited to their presentations. They've been invited to ours. It's nice because you're not reinventing the wheel. You're all in the same group. And we're able to just kind of bounce things off each other and get together. So I'm gonna bounce over to my other screen. Now, the process for chartering First of all, you're going to show your interest and you're going to contact state. You would contact me or if you need to contact your region director and say, hey, I'm thinking about chartering a SEPTA. And the region director would probably get hold of me or if you contact me, I'll talk to you a little bit, see what, what you're thinking. And we would set up an informational meeting. So the informational meeting would be for everyone, you'd send something out and just say, look, we're thinking about starting a SEPSA. Anyone who's interested or has any questions, come on in and we'll discuss it. Excuse me. So then after you have your informational meeting, you're going to have what's called the pre-charter meeting. So that is going to be where your bylaws and your nominating committees are established, where you start getting all of your ducks in a row, per se. So you're going to give notice for your charter at that point and at the state level will start taking care of like the unit code numbers and things like that. So you're not on your own to try to figure all of that out. We walk you right through it. It's not just a, hey, we're going to throw you in situation. So then two weeks before the charter meeting, we as the state would start to get our information together that we're going to bring for you and then you have your charter meeting. So that's where you're going to have your 25 members because you need 25 members. Memberships will be sold there. You're gonna have your election of officers. They'll be installed. Your charter application is completed and signed. And I have to say, it's, I'm corny though. It's kind of cool when you get a charter card because now everything is electronic and the, the new charter cards are actually like a hard copy the first card of the PTA. So you think that our PTAs have been around for so many years. So I, I just got excited when we got ours. It was a cool thing. Um, and then you just go from there. And the thing is, it's we're not as a state level leaving you just to kind of figure it out on your own. You'll have support. Like Liz is there to answer questions. I could answer any questions. I mean, there are a ton of us um, that would be able to answer questions in your region. You have your region board that can answer questions, but you're not alone. And it, like Lissa was saying, that's one thing with a SEPTA, and I see SEPTA in some of the names here. You're, it's, it's nice to be with other people that get it because there is, um, I, I'm in many, many PTAs and then the SEPTA as well. And there's a different feel as a special needs parent when you walk into a SEPTA because you can kind of let your guard down a little and it's like, okay, they, they get it. Like you can, you can just say what you need to say. They, everyone gets it and they understand. And sometimes that's really hard to convey to other people who aren't in the same situation that it's nice just to have that group where 
you know, like someone could look ragged and have a horrible day. And it's like, yeah, we've been there. Not that anyone else doesn't, but they just get it when you're having a hard time. Like with their days where my son is screaming all day long and other people say, oh, my kid screams. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not the same. So it's just that camaraderie too, that when people ask me why, why would I form a SEPSA versus like maybe a special education committee? There's nothing wrong with a committee first, let me say, but the nice thing about the SEPSA is you're your own entity. You're not part of the other group where sometimes it might go by the wayside a little bit because it's a committee. You're able to actually concentrate on your own unit. You can fundraise for your own unit. You can have events with your own unit. You don't have to worry about okay, is the, uh, if you're a committee, is the council or is the unit going to approve this event? You just, and, and I'm saying you're going to have horrible events. I'm just saying sometimes you're limited to events, but it's just nice to have your own entity for, for the students and for yourselves. So it's, it's not the end of the world to, I mean, I know some special education committees who are running really well. Um, we personally started in our district as a special education committee but that said, we started just to kind of get our foot in the door and made it clear that we were going to be utilizing the, the committee to start a SEPSA. So, but hopefully I kind of explained it's how to charter. It's not as hard as it sounds. It's, it's not really as daunting as it sounds. Um, we, I, I know one thing that we were worried about at our unit was having the 25 members. Because with a SEPSA, a lot of times, you're not trying to fundraise to give pencils or do specific programs. You're, you're an advocacy organization and you have speakers come in and you might do fun things. Like we have a back to school picnic at a local park. We provide all the food. We have a sensory bus come. We invite other units um, within the area to come. It's just something where the parents and the students are able to kind of get back together on their own comfortable turf and say, okay, we're going back to school. Let's, let's just kind of have some fun. Hey, Kim and Lisa, I want to chime in. One thing that our school did is we're a small school building. So we have a K-8, one building, 300 and about 80 kids total in our whole school district. We have no high school, a uh, small rural school district in upstate New York. Um, so we did a community SEPTA. So uh, because of our kids go to all different high schools, we started a SEPTA. It's called the Wine and Skill Community SEPTA. I know Kim, you helped us start that. Um, and so we invite all of the local uh, special education families from all of our feeder high schools to, into one SEPTA. Um, so because that's where our kids are going to the other high schools and we found it really great because we've actually uh, we all of our neighbor towns again rural community um, all come to our SEPTA meetings um, you know in our SEPTA events um, we know they have the same thing we have you know once a month something on um, we have speakers come in from um, you know about Medicaid or uh, autism or um, you know intervention or mental health or social emotional learning and then we invite all of the other school buildings in the school districts that there are our feeder school districts and we were just um, just a school building SEPTA um, but then we went to a, the, the quote-unquote community SEPTA and it's really worked out great so just an idea and you've done um, didn't you do an Olympics also yeah, so we so we had a um, uh, Olympics for all students. So it was uh, a, a fantastic, fantastic event where we uh, with, worked with our um, physical education teachers, one who was certified in special education, physical education, which was I had never even known that was a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we had our entire gymnasium, um, all of our typically abled students and our differently abled students all participated together. We made everything friendly for all students. So there was nothing there that any one of our students couldn't do. Um, it was fantastic. We probably had 200 kids there. That's fantastic. I, I wanted to, Kathy had just mentioned, I think everybody saw in the chat, to make sure to invite your district administration, your board of ed members, teachers, parents, everybody. Fantastic idea because the more the better because we all want to have a seat at that table. We all want to be there. So, for example, I live uh, on Long Island, so it's a little different. And over here, not everyone, but for the most part, 
a lot of our septas are, I see the thumbs up, uh, a lot of our septas are for a district wide. So for example, what we did, um, so you know a lot of times the PTAs will have the Harlem Wizards and our district as a whole had the Harlem Wizards come, which was great, except for since septa isn't a school, it put us at a little bit of a disadvantage in that everybody, each of the PTAs were dividing it and getting a certain, you know, a certain amount of tickets per school. So what we did as a SEPTA, because we want to be a part of that and we want to be seen as a part of the community, uh, we worked with them. And so what we did is we got, you know, those foam fingers and we got, and we sold like water and foam fingers with the school district at the event. So we were able to, while they were fundraising through ticket sales and doing it in a different way, we were able to still participate still be seen and still be a viable member, you know, obviously of the community by just in a slightly different way. And so that's where it's nice to think outside the box. So because we don't all have that basis of students, we can always try something new. Oh, is there another question? Anybody have any questions for us in spe about specifics? Or any suggestions about something that worked? Oh, how do you get school staff involvement? Other than a few administrations, our group is treated like kryptonite. I get it. I do get it. I think there's a little of two things. I think there's one. There sometimes they are, as Kim mentioned, afraid that you're going to be adversarial, because we are all very strong advocates. And I also think you know everybody has their own. They tend to think, okay, so the people who are going to help with SEPTA are the people who are typically service providers, um, or you know have a very specific job in the school. So the first step is really reaching out, not just to it, the pupil services, but I reach out to the principal um, at each school. Because FaceTime has value, and the principal certainly cares about the community feeling heard. So when you go there, you go there with a list of your members, and you say, you know, we'd like to reach out to these Teachers, we see that they're not there. What can we do? What, what do you think would benefit them? And many times they just don't think about joining both the SEPTA and the PTA, and it takes that. Um, another way to go about it is if you offer any kind of, there's some grants or sometimes, you know, the offer that the teachers put in, don't only offer it to a specific population in the school. Let all staff apply for it. For example, there may be something that the gym teachers that are looking for that could all children could use, but it could maybe benefit, you know, special education population. You never know. So if you're taking applications or you're opening something up, ask the teachers, do a survey, see what they're looking for, but don't limit yourself in who you ask, and then hopefully that will open the door. And somebody else mentioned that they, I just saw in the chat that they had a suggestion. Yep, Jamie. Lee. That was me. That was me. <laughs> um, I actually also come from Long Island. I'm from Plainview Old Bethpage School District. So some people might know that district, but not. Um, and I have, I'm fortunate enough to come from a district where our SEPTA is um, very active and our PTs pretty much support it. I'm in a unique position where I represent uh, the elementary school that has all of our, as we call them, unique students on elementary level. So my place here today um, is has many hats, uh, which is where I'm kind of representing my PTA in the seat of how do we work better with SEPTA and also kind of pulling some really good ideas for our SEPTA. But a really good suggestion that I had for how do you get your staff involved in all of that. Through the pandemic, we had a really unique experience where we set up a weekly meeting with PPS, obviously over Zoom. And that included our SEPTA um, board at large. And so that was people who sat on committees, which included myself. I represent the, I sat on the uh, elementary curriculum committee. Uh, and we had an opportunity to sit down every week from the time of closure, which the last day our kids were in school was March 9th. Uh, and we had an opportunity every week to say what worked, what didn't, uh, suggestions for what you know we could improve, what could we do better, and also I found through that that once my my child service providers found out uh, that that was happening, that they then came to me at the end of my daughter's sessions and said, "Hey, this isn't working. 
that isn't working. FMP is crashing when we're trying to pull it up. All of these different things. And they knew that, that I would be able to pass that along. And slowly but surely that PPS SEPTA board meeting every week became a big, gigantic stakeholder kind of brainstorm session and how to do it better and make it better. And it was so successful that it's going to be continued regardless if we're in building, out building, and whatever going forward. And I highly encourage anybody, whatever, wherever you are in your process, that is an amazing place to go and to also to encourage teachers to be a part of because it's a wonderful resource for everybody all around, including from PPS top down. I can't even tell you how many ideas that we see we mentioned months ago that are now coming into our reopening plan as a result for our children. And so that was just, it was an amazing experience. It's going to be continued. And I highly, highly, highly recommend putting it out there and, and pushing for it because it's really, really helpful. Thank you so much. That's, that's really very valuable. Um, I have one other uh, question I think Kyle had. I think this would be for yep. Kim. Uh, um, she was what happens when a traditional PTA may resist a SEPSA? This does happen. So um, it's something new. So a lot of people aren't familiar with SEPSAs and then you see another PTA coming in and they might think that it's taking away from their unit or it's an either or when it comes to membership, like, well, our parents aren't gonna pay for two memberships. It doesn't have to be us against them. Like we need each other in order to make this work because we want those PTAs and we've suggested and we've seen these um, sepsis who want a charter invite the, the PTAs in and say, look, we're part of the community, you're part of the community, we need you. So we're not asking you to do anything. We just wanna see like what, what can we do to maybe help with special education, this, this facet, or we'd really just like your support, whether we can even like give one of our membership forms out at one of your events, or if like Lisa was saying when they did the fundraising and they were able to be part of it as well. Um, it, the whole thing is to really push that it's not an us against them situation. It's, it's an all, it's for everyone. Like it's something where I guess maybe sometimes to me, it's kind of black and white, but you have more people who are there to support the kids. So it's not like they're taking away or saying that, okay, the, the PTAs, in the district aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing for their kids. It's just, hey, you know what? You guys are doing 50 million things that are amazing. We're gonna concentrate on this one thing and we gotcha. And you guys keep doing what you're gonna do because we all need each other. I mean, we, PTA is, I mean, every child one voice we say. And that's kind of how I look at the SEPSA PTA thing where it's, it, they're different units, but you have the same purpose, the same voice, and you're able to do more. So, because yeah, we have definitely seen units where they get very concerned that it's going to interfere with their fundraising dollars, and it, it doesn't, it, it really doesn't. I mean, I just, I, I can't even say anything else except for it, it just doesn't. I mean, any of you who out there who have been part of a SEPSA know that it's not going to cut into their budgets. So, can I can I say something? Sure. Um, we we're um, Monroe. I'm part of Monroe Woodbury um, SEPTA, and uh, I'm no longer on the board, but um, it's a it's a huge district, and SEPTA was a se uh, district wide PTA. And we did run into that years ago, way back when. And um, we worked, you know, uh, because there's, I think, seven or eight PTAs in our district, we have council. And what we ended up doing between all the PTAs was making it, you know, because people have siblings and whatever, making it so that each PTA, when they did their fundraisers, it didn't conflict with another PTA's fundraiser. And um, one, one of the big things that our SEPTA did was we, we would have once a year a large speaker in. 
that was usually our first meeting and we would try to gear it towards um you know the whole district because there's a lot of a lot of things there's a lot of kids out there with different undiagnosed issues and a lot of the um speakers it was it was pertinent to all all students you know all students parents teachers and we would get you know parents who weren't part of septa teachers not just special education teachers but you know doing things that benefited the whole district um, so, you know I think that what I really love about what you said is how different children, now it's not limited to only one part of the population. And I think especially now, because with the distance learning, some children who may have appeared completely, you know, as typical learners, all of a sudden parents are discovering that maybe they have some additional needs. Um, so just before we get to the, the question, the big pop-up, I think a big issue for many of your, uh, your populations, and you may want to think about bringing information, is on assistive technology. Um, because I think that that is a very big issue. Parents may not be aware of what is out there. Um, of what their computers can do or what the school has available or and I think that that is something that um, shouldn't be limited to only those who are somebody shares that information. Okay. Sorry, my internet got wacky, but now it's better. Okay. Um, so I had a, a saw a question. Yep, there are two. Other um, so how do you guys do you see the one from Jen? Yep. Do you, how do we get our district to provide education on different disabilities to all children? is a fantastic question. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure, I'd love to hear some of what you guys have to say. I, I think that we have, like I have found in several PTAs that, again, bringing in books, but not just the book, the book but a speaker, somebody that they can actually connect with, um, especially if the person who is presenting um, is actually somebody with a disability. There's an organization here on Long Island um, that does, um, they help find jobs and they offer services for families and they came to the SEPTAs and they came and spoke and they brought members of their community and that was really very powerful because you start to realize, you know, we're all human and it, it really brought a lot of things home and I think that also obviously, um, working with your district to understand that um, their children, your children's classmates may or may not have a disability. Not every, just they, you know, not every child is in a wheelchair um, is this, has, you know, is not a disability. Every, just because a child's not in a wheelchair does not mean that they don't have a disability. And I think it's just really important that we work with the district because they want to share that information. And bullying is a big topic right now. And this is a part of your father. So does anybody else have a suggestion of something that they had done in their district? Oh, Kim. I do. I um, do. One thing. Oh, that go first, go first, go first. Oh, sorry. One thing that we have done, um, actually, just very quickly, my son went to developmental kindergarten. So it was at a different school. So then when he was in first grade, he was in a different elementary school. And one thing that I noticed is they never integrated the kids into the building properly. So here's my son flapping like crazy, like running around the room and everything, and nobody understood. And I finally had a parent come up to me and say, I'm really sorry, but my son just like, he is so flustered by your son every day. And I don't mean to be mean. I'm like, thank you for telling me because I didn't know how it was affecting other kids. So since first grade, I have gone in every year and only one year has my son been in the room when I've done it. Um, and it's his choice. And I have read a book, like what autism's about. I have fielded any questions. I pretty much opened Alex up because I wanted people to see, okay, yes, there's something different, but this is what it is. And they would answer, they asked me questions like, did he get autism by falling out of a tree? Does he have super hearing? Does he like all of these questions? And then all of a sudden the kids were like, well, wait a minute, I do this too. I do, and, and I've done this. And we found that every year that we, that we did that and I went up, it helped the kids to where kids who would be in the same class the next year, like, 
can you tell the ice cream story where he heard the ice cream truck in the back of the neighborhood with the windows down and everything? And they were going nuts. And we ended up in our district. Um, I worked with some of the special education teachers at the middle and high school levels. And they have started actually giving presentations on different disabilities throughout the district in the same way. Because realistically, you need to start young so they understand instead of starting in high school, because like it was mentioned, bullying is, is real. So even like getting the parents involved or having someone come in just to humanize and I hate to say that word, but that's really what it was until the kids know what it is. It's kind of the fear of the unknown. And I just, uh, to add exactly what you said, when I did something similar, one of the kids asked me, is it catchy? Um, so that is something that, you know, as simple as it seems to us, but to kids can actually get the truth is important because it gets the honest out there and they get to learn meet the child just for the child. So I'm sorry, um, Jamie? Sorry, my husband is texting the shopping list. You know how it is. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, what I wanted to bring up was, is that um, a suggestion to the answer to the question and also a little bit of an anecdote. Um, my daughter's a fourth grader and in our building, our elementary school, as I said, houses all of our elementary school leveled unique students as we like to refer to them in our district and our kids are insanely protective of them they come into that building as kindergartners and we are immersive from the start and those kids that are not immersive um, are visible everywhere in our everywhere whether it be recess whether it be gym they're it, everywhere from the start these kids know and i remember last year when the kids were asked elementary school kids you know, what do you see being like an issue coming back to school with the environment we're having now? Like, well, what are, what are our special kids, what are our unique kids gonna do? How are they gonna know what hallways to walk down? How are we gonna make sure that they don't touch each other so they don't get sick? Our kids were more concerned about our unique students than they were about their own self health or safety. And it exactly proves the point of if young, you get them young, completely immersive, it blurs the lines, absolutely. And it's amazing to see our kids just, the bullying does not, it just doesn't exist because it, to them, it's just that there's no difference, absolutely no difference. And to ants, which is great, it's beautiful. And we, we every single year we have an anti-bullying assembly and we're very big on that. And we're in a place for hate school, which helps support that. But having the kids come in those little babies and kindergartners, and it's just right there, normal this is it this is society this is how it's built they it's absolutely it's another day ending and why to them and it's beautiful to watch uh as a suggestion for how do you educate kids uh cultural your cultural arts person on your gen ed pta as sometimes it's referred to it can be your best friend i'm speaking as the vp of cultural arts and it this is the second time I'm taking this position. I always make sure that every single program is fully inclusive. And I always make sure to bring in one program that has, I would say about a 75% focus in on special education. So that way our kids are A, see everything is inclusive, of course, and B, something is being brought in that's going to educate them on how everybody can work together, whether it be an anti-bullying assembly that's going to, we then tell those, you know, that the presenter, we want to focus anti-bullying on differences between people. You know, sometimes you can't always tell when somebody is different. Invisible illnesses, right? My daughter is special education because she is an OHI. She's been had chronic. She's was diagnosed with migraines at four, and they're completely physically debilitating to the point of hospitalization. So it's kind of hard sometimes for kids to understand why she needs to wear sunglasses and headphones in class. So we often, not just myself, but people before me and after me, we really focus in on bringing in those cultural arts programs through BOCES. And Lisa, I'm sure you know all about it being from Long Island. Your cultural arts person can be your best friend. And they can, there are so many, um, I was just looking at it the other day, uh, programs on the cultural arts list, whether it be through music, um, you know, you have the Hip Pickles um, and so many other groups that are on there musically. Just, I'm a musician by trade, so that's the first thing I think of that um, can discuss differences 
can introduce those things to the kids and many, many other programs, cultural arts, that it's a good first step for bringing it in and introducing it that's um, actually, for the kids. That's a really great idea. And it's a, it's a nice way that they're, you know, working together, um, the, you know, for all the children. Cause I think that is the, the key. <laughs> um, but we're, I can't believe we're, Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, we have one more question that was on there that I was Go trying to answer a little bit through the messages, but it's, it's a little difficult. So what does the special education committee do? And so what I had written, it's, it can do the same thing, but under a PTA unit. Um, so it can be, it, it, it's kind of like if you have your yearbook committee or your membership committee, you can have a special education committee under that unit as well. And it just, um, it depends on what you want to do, what you want to do with it. So if it's something where like a lot of times, not that a, a, a committee can't do it, but a lot of times a SEPSA wants to bring in the speakers or partner with other units or just be their own entity where they can really concentrate on this, where it's, they're not trying to pull other people. Um, and sometimes to be honest, it's hard to pull other people for a committee in um, PTA with other things. If, and if it's a special needs parent, I mean, I, I'll speak for myself, I have four children. So I kind of like the idea that there's a separate SEPSA because I know that the, the guilt in me also would be there if it was just a committee on like one of the units that my children belong to. And I'm like, oh, I could really be doing this committee that that's for the kids over here, but it's special education and I need to do, sometimes I just like that it's separate. Um, it just, it makes it feel a little bit better. We all have the parental guilt and it's just nice because I don't feel like I'm choosing between one child versus the other sometimes. So that was one thing. Um, I don't think I've ever said that out loud either, but oh well. Um, but that was one thing with the SEPSA that I really liked. It was like I could take that breath of, okay, this is a special education PTA. It's meant for that. This is what we're going to do here. So when I'm over at the elementary school or the middle school or the high school, I can concentrate on what needs to be done there. And then I can concentrate on special education group together. So, and yeah, it had put on there. It really depends what your goal is. If you're just looking to do something in your, in your school and you're like, let's have a special education unit to where, I, I don't know, let's make sure that we have coverage for every event so everyone can attend. That's great. So it just needs, it just depends what you want to do. Thank you. I think that, oh, I'm sorry. Lisa, hi, before we cut off, I want to say something. Uh, uh, I've been in the other side of the, of the, uh, of the table. I've actually represented a uh, billion dollar company to bring uh, services to my school district. And I've advocated where to the point that we have a first uh, uh, kindergarten class that when the, the children return, from a uh, center-based program, they're able to uh, integrate back into the school. But now, I identified these situations when I had this meeting and the superintendent had no idea, supposedly. Um, and um, and uh, the special educa educator didn't know that the travel distance for the, these children was uh, five hours daily, two hours going and two hours coming back. Um, Another thing that I noticed was that the SEPTA, my particular SEPTA in my area, has not been able to grow, but not because of the parent lack of participation, but the lack of allowing integration in, in their leadership and, uh, and, uh, and having close uh, um, groups where it's you're, you're invited or not. Uh, creating a very bad ha atmosphere. Uh, they even have sent me a letter with my own advocacy, which I was quite shocked. Um, uh, and uh, this is something that I've always brought across to uh, the uh, state PTA, which is something that we have to take care of because we cannot grow if we don't want to say accept one inside the group. Um, and I'm not far from... Uh, um, my colleague over here um, at uh, uh, Woodbury, um, her her SEPTA has grown tremendously, and she has a big community community of Latinos. 
I have 40% in my school of Latinos, but yet nobody shows up. And mm -hmm. I actually go to a pastor that tells, that tells me he has an entire group of Latinos that are interested very much in the child's education. The lack of the uh, ability to speak proper English or coming from a country where they um, don't really do much advocacy because it's not uh, allowed kind of immediately kind of uh, turns them away. There's also the immigration issue. So, but they're still parents and, yeah. all, and, and disabilities doesn't care where you come from. You know, we can all uh, have children that are disabled. It doesn't matter what color, what language you speak. So, I, so I, I so um, it's one of those things where I think that we may have to do a some sort of uh, as we identify these uh, um, um, set up charters, we should also then pursue to see if the issues are that you just don't want to allow other parents to participate, and we should then. Uh, have a uh, further talk as to what it has to be done. Because I've been with this journey for two years, trying to find a way, even the school itself has volunteered to bring in um, a translator and other services, which have been denied. Uh, Luis, Luis, I'm gonna jump in um, because we are already over five minutes and the next workshop is gonna start in one minute. I wanna just comment that your, you, your comments are fantastic. And just so you know, and everybody knows, we're gonna be launching a new um, Hispanic, Latino, and diversity initiative. So stay tuned about that. Um, and, and I apologize, I have to cut everybody off because we are starting the next workshop right now. We were supposed to have a five minute break. Um, but Kim, Lissa, do you have anything to wrap up quickly? If not, we're gonna transition to the next, the three o'clock workshop. Just email Kim or myself. We gave our emails out in the, in the beginning and please reach out to us and we're happy to follow up on any more questions and we've loved this discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yay, okay. We're gonna transition to our three o'clock workshop. Sarah, are you on yet? Hold on, I know Sarah's in the room with me so I'm trying to find her on here. Here's Sarah, Sarah, I don't see you on video. Um, I just see your, I, I just see you. Can you guys hear Sarah? I see Sarah. Yeah. Sarah, do you see Sarah now? Yeah, she's muted. <laughs> she's sideways. She's also sideways. <laughs> sideways and muted. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Oh, there you are. I see you now. 